Final question before we open things up again are about, you know, possible futures. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to predict the future, but I, I, would, <laughs> I would love, because uh, I know I hate when people ask me, what's going to happen? <laughs> but, but I think it's, it, you know, in the spirit of everything that's been said, this is a moment where we get to dream, where we get to imagine, where we get to put out our bold visions and, and think beyond the horizon of what was possible before, right? Um, and, and also to share our, our fears and worries, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, the future is incredibly um, volatile, oh. uncertain, and, and um, full, filled with danger. <laughs> um, and so um, if, if, if each of you would, would just, you know, just bring some of your um, meditations on, on the future and what lies ahead, that would be, that would be wonderful. Um, I think it's like, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. No, no, you should for the go change first. of word. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. No, but I just wanted to say, like, I feel like this is a very important question, and I feel like we should definitely open it up to the room. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, I know that, like, you practice every day, that you have an imagination, you sketch it out, and then you realize it, and it becomes like it, like all of a sudden a creature in the room, and you're like, oh, <laughs> like this was a thought the other day, and now it's existing in a way. So, like, this is our super power as humans that we're able to imagine things and we're able to realize it that's powerful so I, but it is a very embodied experience yeah. so i was gonna suggest that everybody like maybe stretch and <laughs> <laughs> take a deep breath and like really like really imagine you know? <laughs> like, if this is a collective imagination i i feel like there's so much power that comes in that, and I just wanted to invite everyone mm. in this imagination, not only mm. just the four, nice. the five of us. Beautiful. But please, yeah. you go first. Oh, no, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually glad what you said. I would just add something like probably too concrete and too dry, but I think it's important, and I think you have to think about it. You mentioned what are, what are some of the aspects that. I'm sort of thinking that it's sort of unfolding in this uprising, and I think it's useful in global stage. I think one of the things that is happening is that uh, at this moment, as part of this revolution, people are redef redefining the notion of a social movement. Yeah. Uh, and this notion, I think, has been sort of in crisis for some time now. Mm -hmm. We've gone through different stages. For a while, the idea was that the leader would tell you the main ideas, and there would be a pyramid, and the, me the, the members, the soldiers, would take care of like uh, carrying out the ideas. Then there was a, a period of going for the full democratization of how the practice of social movements should happen. So, uh, and, and I'm sure have you, if you've seen in a meeting that for even deciding about the time of an event. There's like one hour conversation. It's like five or 5.30 or six, and no one wants, wants to make that final call because in the back of our, of our heads, we don't want to be the leader. Something else is happening, and that thing is actually important. It's a practice of democracy and a practice of a lot of other things. But that, I feel, through this movement is, is coming under question in the sense that this is wonderful, and we did get something important from it. But it's not the most efficient way of going about things. And no one wants to make the sort of the, uh, the move to, to the back. But this question of how the social movement should look like in the 20, 21st century mm -hmm. is, I think, is one of the questions that this movement is sort of grappling with. And not only around the question of the leader, but also around the question of inclusion. Uh, whose politics should be played out? Mm -hmm. If all these bodies with different difference, with differences and with different demands are in the room and trying to uh, make something happen together, or what is the notion of mobilization? I do think something is cooking up as part of the Gina's revolution. Something is happening, and people are taking deep breaths. That's important <laughs> part of it. Uh, and I do think, I do think it's, it might be might sound of, of a huge claim to say, but I feel what comes out of this uprising as sort of one possibility of going about doing social practice and doing social movement can offer inspiration globally. Because, uh, I mean, this is something, uh, it's only my experience, I don't want to generalize it, but my experience of having worked around uh, issues of women in Iran, in US, and also being how organization happens in two different geographies, 
it happens that the questions that people are grappling with are actually similar. Although geographies are very different and those localities and uh, the cultures around them and the temporality, uh, temporality of it brings about different ways of doing it and creates different possibilities, but the main questions are actually the same. So I do look at the Gina's uprising, it's just a, one of the way of looking at it, is as a way of going forward to answer the question, how social movements will look like globally around the world. And this is one way of telling us or give us, giving us some hints about that question. Mm. Uh, yeah, you want to jump in? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just taking notes. <laughs> uh, I think that's a really, really important and really significant question at the moment. Um, the question of future scares me. It is scary, and like in my personal and political life, I tend not to think about future that much. <laughs> But I want to just, um, because I just don't want to end it so pessimist, I just want to take us back to uh, the name of Gina, like Gina means giving life. And I think this has been a movement uh, that is like collectively demanding life. And people are doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you go there and when you actually walk in the streets of a different cities in Iran, you see that we are talking about a future and they're living the future now. Mm -hmm. Like, this is their present. Like, when you think about wearing or not wearing hijab, when you think about like grappling with all of these ideologies on a day-to-day -day basis from the moment that you want to leave home, even from the moment that you wake up, because like the police exists in your bedroom too, right? Because they are all, they're everywhere. So when you're like, like thinking about, and so thinking about these questions on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel like, uh, the future is now, and the future is the very present, and the everyday resistance and the everyday co-resistance that is happening on the streets in Iran right now. Even though it might not look like collective actions or like similar strategies as last year anymore, but people on a day-to-day -day basis are attempting, they're trying so hard to resist the structures that existed, and they're, so I feel like I don't really want to respond to the mm -hmm. question of future, mm -hmm. but I want us to think about the moment of now mm -hmm. and how uh, life cannot be postponed into future. Mm -hmm. Life is happening right now on the streets of Iran, and people are trying so hard to, like, I don't know, make resistance uh, an everyday part mm -hmm. of their lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I add something to that? Yes, and then part and then what's happening. I mean, I'm so happy that you brought out the notion of time. And just something quickly. Uh, there is this stereotype about the global south that they're in the past. Mm -hmm. The south is always in the past. And right. the future is happening in the west. Uh -huh. And there's this temporality going on sure. that things are asynchronous. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case. We're all living at the same time within <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> and <there's laughs> <not asynchronous. laughs> But putting that aside. Uh, I do think Gina's revolution is very interesting in the sense that it is in the future and we're in the past uh -huh. looking at it in yeah. this location. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think this is the, yeah, I think that's that's really um, poignant what you said and very, very yeah. important. And also what all yeah. of you guys said, um, I don't have much to add to that. I think there is no future. I don't believe in future. Everything is the present. <laughs> and, and, and I think, uh, as you beautifully said, Bahar, in the name of Gina, and you know, uh, everything that this movement has uh, you know, revealed to us is um, all about inspiration and aspiration and hope. And we have no other way but to be hopeful. But, and that's an important <laughs> thing. <But laughs> so the, the present is scary. The present is truly scary and, and fearful of how mechanisms of oppression by the state um, has played out uh, over the past few months. Um, you know, as much as there has been this push against the, the, uh, the patriarchy and, and, and institutionalist misogyny, they have come forward with much more sophisticated modes of oppression. Um, I'm talking about legalization, legislation, um, 
that you know happened over the past few uh, weeks and you know went into pla a place three days ago. This is the present we are living, mm -hmm. and you know, and I think every moment there, uh, you know, there, there really. Um, the, the price and the cost that people have to now pay for the everyday uh, civil disobedience is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. And I think our responsibility um, as people in diaspora, as people that uh, you mentioned at the very beginning, to acknowledge the freedom, that the freedom of speech that we have here, um, is to constantly remind um, and 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 write about it and document it and uh, theorize it. You know, this is this is I think the responsibility mm -hmm. that we have. That nothing has died out in Iran. The fact that people are not in the street, the fact that people are not shouting every day in the streets and getting, uh, you know, receiving bullets in their heads or getting blinded and raped, and they are being still killed in prisons and tortured in prisons. In fact, today a 14-year-old Baluchi. Uh, teenager was killed right on the first anniversary of the massacre that happened last year. So, you know, to not be numbed by the numbers, mm -hmm. to not think about people who are getting killed as as pure numbers, and I think this is something Naomi Klein says about um, Palestinians turning into numbers in, mm -hmm. in the social media and, and, and you know mm -hmm. the, the news headlines. And I think that's very much the case about any clon colonized body marginalized body, including the bodies of Iranians. Mm -hmm. And I think in order to, to push for that decolonization, we have to you know, acknowledge this, this paradigm shift. We have to rethink and revise, and I think it's very difficult right, for a lot of our folks in the post-colonial studies. It's just simply very difficult to acknowledge Islamic Republic as a colonial power. Um, but I think if, if that happens, mm -hmm. you know, that shift happens um, and goes into practice, it, a lot of things will change. Mm -hmm. when, um, well, when that shift happens. And that epistemological, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that yeah. epistemological change yeah. needs to be theorized, needs to be discussed, and I think academia is a place for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm truly grateful to Barnard College for actually giving us this space to bring academia and activism into conversation. And let me tell you, as someone coming from United, uh, you know, University of Pennsylvania, this is not the case on every any. It's difficult. We are actually, and I'm going to say that because I think it's relevant. We are having this co um, conference happening next week at uh, University oh, of Pennsylvania, yeah. gender global protest, um, a woman life freedom um, uh, as a uh, global gender protest. Please look it up and please register and please attend. Virtually, you can attend. Mm -hmm. We had so much difficulty. It's unbelievable. I'm shocked as an associate professor to bring this, uh, to make this happen. We had financial issues, no support whatsoever. And mm -hmm. as we speak right now, there is Palestine Rights Happening Festival happening on campus. And our colleagues and our stu Palestinian students on campus have been threatened, have been, you know, there has been a huge yeah. smear campaign yeah. against them. So I just want to say, cherish this. And you know, this, this is important. And this, is, and this room, every single one of you who is sitting here, I'm grateful to, to you for coming out and for yeah. listening to this conversation. And I think here is the change. And the change can start from here, yeah. and it will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.